it's been a really exciting year for, for us and our learning curve. And so we thought, you know what? We need, your, your kids are coming home probably, and math looks different. Perhaps the conversations look different. So we thought it would be um, important to um, let you see what we're doing. And maybe you could spread that word in our community as well, what you learned tonight as you're in the grocery store, or the soccer field, or wherever it is parents talk with one another, because we know that happens. Um, but so we're excited that you're here. I want to start with saying that we are, I would say this year, we're in a very good, solid year with our math curriculum. Um, you know, we were kind of waiting for the state to adopt some new math textbooks that were Common Core line. We were looking at a lot of materials, but what the publishers did, they just put a label on and said it's Common Core and it wasn't really any different. So as a district, we really wanted to wait. And so this is our first year of a K-8 math adoption. We have something for our elementary school and something different for our middle schools. With that, we felt it was really important that we bring along um, an, an somebody who could help us um, tie our curriculum, our new textbooks, with the changes in pedagogy that are required for our math instruction. And that has happened. And um, so I'm going to introduce you to the team that's responsible for this. I'm going to start by introducing you to our new assistant superintendent, Dr. Andy Johnson. He's new with us this year, doing a great job, um, but had the vision of um, seeing math transformations, um, professional learning take hold in his district in Poway. And when we first met, he goes, okay, I'm going to you know, put this on the table, but by the end of the year, our teachers are gonna say, we can't live without it. It's that good of professional learning. And so it's March, and that conversation probably started happening pretty strong in December. So it was true, and our teachers are here to talk as well. So I'd like to introduce him. He's gonna introduce the speakers tonight and uh, what will take place, but just an official welcome. Thanks for being here, and we hope you pass on what you learned tonight. Um, to people that you meet, um, you know, in your community. Thank you. Thank you, and I'll be very brief. My name is Andy Johnson. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of um, Educational Services here in the district, so that means all the curriculum and instructional side of what we do. And part of my job is to work with teachers in supporting uh, their efforts in the classroom to provide excellent instruction to your children. So in this era of Common Core standards, I know a lot of people have heard a lot of things. People talk about what the Common Core is, what the Common Core isn't, how great it is, how not great it is. Uh, we felt it was really important to have an evening like tonight where we could kind of really dr drill down a little bit and, and um, kind of pull the curtain back and just say, this is what this is. Um, this is what your children are experiencing in school. This is what's different um, from what we all experienced when we were in school. And I hope that by the end of tonight, you're gonna say, okay, that makes some sense. Uh, you may still have some questions. We will have some time for questions uh, tonight as well. But I thought it was really important for us to open this conversation with you so that you know what it is we're doing uh, during the school day with your kids. I think it's very, very powerful and very positive. Um, but it's not enough for me to just, just to say it's powerful and it's positive. We want to kind of show you that. So uh, with that, I want to introduce to you um, uh, Dr. Andrea Vera, who is a math consultant with Math Transformations. I've been working with Andrea for five years, six years, somewhere along those lines. Uh, we worked together for a number of years in Poway, and when I came to Lakeside, I brought her with, us, with me, uh, kind of, sort of, uh, to, to work with our teachers. Um, because making the kinds of shifts that we're talking about are tough for teachers. Um, teachers have ways that they've, they've, they've done things for a lot of years as well. So we want to make sure that we're doing what we need to do as a district to support them. So with that, uh, Dr. Brown. Thank you, thank you. Uh, math is my passion, and making sure that students are introduced to mathematics in a way that's engaging and exciting and empowering for them. I do research through UCSD on classroom instruction in mathematics and how that affects student learning. And I'll be leading our presentation tonight to help you think deeply about what the Common Core shifts mean for your children. But before we do that, I wanted to introduce a panel of teachers that we have here. I've been so lucky to be invited to come in and work with the teachers in Lakeside, and I have found it to be a really exciting experience. The teachers here are open and willing to try new things, and they already have a ton that they know 
about how kids learn mathematics and best practices. So I just get to be the lucky one to come and help them find the best ways of adding on to what they already know. So I'm going to have each teacher introduce themselves. Hello, I'm Mickey King. This is my 20th year teaching in Lakeside, greatest district ever. <laughs> and I teach fourth grade at Lakeview, and I am so excited that we have math transformations to help us to these shifts in Common Core, because of course over the 20 years, I've seen math change quite a lot, but as we know math, it's still numbers. And I think by the end of this presentation, you're gonna be really impressed with where your children are going to be going based on what we'll be teaching them and the shifts and changes. Hello, my name is Amanda Bender. I am a teacher at Lakeview as well. I teach fourth and fifth grade. This is my third year in the district, but it is wonderful to get to experience um, a district that really gives back to their teachers in the way of professional development and opportunities to learn. Um, because we are always learners, so this has been a great experience, and I'm excited that you all get to see what we've been working on with your children. Hello, uh, my name is John Duggan. I am a 6th and 8th grade math teacher here at Lakeside Middle School, and uh, the experiences that we've had with professional development this year have been great, um, especially tailored with the new curriculum that we've adopted this year. Uh, we're really excited to kind of uh, showcase this to you and show you what we're doing inside of the classrooms. My name is Stephanie Nguyen. I teach sixth grade at Sierra Del Sol Middle School and I also teach one period of seventh grade and I think they addressed everything about how positive, um, what a positive impact we've been having in the math uh, professional development. So we're excited to share it with you guys. One of the things that you should know is this presentation is meant to be interactive, so we will be asking you to talk with each other and ask questions and share out ideas. So don't hesitate as we go along if something comes to your mind to go ahead and raise your hand. And, and if we're going somewhere, you know, I'll give you a nod, let you know I'm coming back to you in a minute, or I might just call on you right then, okay? Um, one of the goals for tonight are to really help you understand what all of the Common Core math standards and why do they even exist. What do they mean for your child here in Lakeside? And in general, how can you help your child at home? We know that that is sometimes the foremost question on people's mind. Now there's a lot that we'll be sharing with you and, and some of it may be super intriguing. At the very end, we get to where you can, how you can help your child at home, but feel free to ask questions about that along the way too. So since we are going to have this be interactive, we're going to get you warmed up with talking. So I'm going to show you four numbers, and what I'd like you to do is look at those numbers and think about which of those numbers does not belong. And one of the things we're pushing your kids to do is to be able to explain their thinking as clearly as possible. So you get to take a look at those, think for a minute, and when you're ready, turn and talk to someone near you. If you see someone alone, please ensure, make sure they get someone to talk to which don't belong and why, and we'll ask you to share out in a minute. Okay. Uh, so just explain that I'm not seeing it right now. Now we know that's a big misconception with the Common Core Standards. People think, oh, there is no correct answer to anything that we're doing. That's not true. This is a problem that has multiple ways you can think about it, but there are moments where there are definitely correct answers, but not here. So, would somebody like to share their thinking? Go ahead. should be 36, that would be a nice sequential square root. Okay, so tell us a little bit more about that. This is what we do with the kids. Can you tell us a little bit more about these square numbers and what you're thinking? Well, square root is 9, 16, 25. Square root of 9 is 3, square root of 16 is 4, 25 is 5. And then if that was uh, 36, you know, or anything different, you know, you have 36, you have 3, 4, 5, 6. That would make you happy. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anyone else in the room that thought about square numbers up there and square roots? So we saw some other people who thought about it that way. Did someone think about it differently? Go ahead, yes. Okay, so if we're thinking about it as odd numbers and even numbers, which number doesn't belong? Okay, I hear it saying 16 because everyone, it's an even number. And that's something we're pushing the kids to do. A research shows that if you ask a question and the kids give an answer, 
It's that second question that we ask, the why, that really allows them to think. And even at kindergarten, we're saying why. Why do you think that? Tell us more. Okay, so we have an odds and even idea. We have a square number idea. Is there anything else that you thought of? Yes? Now, I know that some people over here heard it, and some people didn't, so I'm going to bring the microphone over. Or not. So three different ways to think about this. How many of you saw it that way? How many of you saw it as odds and evens? How many of you saw it as square numbers? Okay, did anybody see it differently? Do you want to use a microphone or can you yeah, talk loud? I was just going to say nine because it was the only one that um, was a single digit. That's right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How many of you looked at double digit versus single digit numbers? Okay. So with our kids, we use simple exercises like this to get them to start opening their minds to there's more than one way to think about things. Doesn't mean we're saying there's no right answer in the case of computation and arithmetic, but there's definitely more than one way to get there. And that's something that we push on. Sure this goes. So one of the things before we begin talking that we like to do is get a sense of what you know about the Common Core Standards. Now this is a danger zone sometimes, so we're not too worried about all the politics and everything right now. Just what do you know about what they are themselves? Um, why don't you take a minute and just talk with a partner about what do you know about the Common Core Math Standards? Ah, and let's share out some of your ideas. I'm a little bit scared, but hopefully you'll be kind here. So. What do you know about the Common Core Standards? Who's willing to offer up an idea? What do you know is different than what do you think or how do you, how do you think it, right? It's a little bit trickier. Go ahead. Okay, did you guys hear that? I'm gonna go ahead and revoice it for her. She said that it's more than just coming up with the answer, it's how you came up with the answer. Okay, that's definitely one of the underpinnings of Common Core standards and, and what we're pushing for. What else? What else have you heard, or what do you know? Yes. Did you guys hear that over there? Collaboration, more collaboration. Okay. So what else do you know? Anything else? We know we hear there's more collaboration. There's you know more than one way to think about things. It's not only about getting correct answers. Anything else? another thing we do with kids, really patient wait time. Thank you. Okay. So what we want you to know first and foremost is that the Common Core Standards are simply that. It's a set of standards. It's not a political position. It's a set of standards. And this is the first time in my professional career that the standards, that set of standards saying that the content that our students are supposed to know actually matches what the highest performing countries are saying that students need to know. And it matches the research that's out there. It's the very first time I've been in education for 25 years. And it's a really, really powerful set of standards. The challenge is helping everyone understand that it's just that. It's standards. So it's what students need to know. And it has this other component, which is equally balanced, and it's called the mathematical practices. That's the newest part to people. The content standards are what they will learn. You've been familiar with that for a long time, and you've seen standards over the years. But the mathematical practices are habits of mind. It's that we want kids to encounter a complex problem and be in the habit of thinking they can persevere through it and have strategies for, to persevere. It's the idea that they have tools. They can actually look around the classroom or at home and find some sort of a tool. Maybe it's a, a pencil. Maybe it's a calculator. Maybe it's a T-chart. Maybe it's a manipulative. Any sort of tool that can help them persevere. These habits of mind include argumentation, that students get used to having to defend their thinking in very specific ways be convincing. We know in the workforce that's important, right? You can't be an emotional defense of something. It has to be a logical, well-reasoned argument. That's a big part of the Common Core Math Standards. 
There are eight mathematical practices, and our teachers are working really hard right now to understand what those mean and how we can help students develop those kinds of mind in the classroom. It's the most challenging part. The misunderstanding in the media right now is that we're te the Common Core Standards tell you how you have to teach. They really don't. It's just a collection of the content that kids need to learn and these sort of habits of mind, ways that we want them to think about mathematics. Teachers can do that in a lot of different ways. So it's often just how someone interprets it that ends up being the voice in the media that you hear. So something that's important to think about is why do these standards even exist? And I mentioned to you earlier that the standards are modeled after the highest performing countries. So you'll see up on this slide, these are, this is just the top part of a page of all the different countries that participate regularly every four years in the trends in international math and science assessment, it's a study. And it's fourth graders and eighth graders that are assessed. And you can see highlighted in green there is where the United States falls. There are a lot of countries that are outperforming us and a lot of countries that are not. But we want our students to be competitive in math and science. We know that's critical. And so as the Common Core Standards were developed, the researchers and the authors went and visited schools in Japan. They went to Singapore. They went to Korea. They went and said, what's going on in those classrooms? What do their standards look like? What are the things that are really essential here? It's the first time that that's really affected our standards, too. And one of the things they figured out is in addition to the fact that our kids struggle with fractions, do you guys, any of you have a fraction phobia right now? We're never going to say that to our kids. We're going to say we love fractions, okay? And in addition to the fact that fractions are a challenge, they also figured out that our kids struggle with critical thinking. We also know that. We, we know how we were educated, right? We did a lot of, you know, repeat procedures. But they also discovered that our curriculum, our books, had so much content in them that we only had time to cover it in the school year. Chapter by chapter, lesson by lesson. I tell you to do this, you do it, move on. I tell you, you do it, really shallow understanding. Tons of standards, a mile wide and an inch deep. And so Dr. Johnson's going to talk to you a little bit about something that he loves to talk about. Well, she, she gives me this slide because when I first saw this slide, I think it was Andrea who showed me this slide, uh, it really showed me visually what, what she's trying to describe here with these countries. So. On the left here, what you see, this is kind of a graphic vision, um, uh, representation of the topics that are taught in the grade level. So you see across the top of the different grade levels, first, second, third, fourth, and on, in these what they call A-plus countries. So these are the, these are the countries that where the students are performing very, very well in mathematics. So you can see in, in first grade there are three topics, in second grade there are three topics, in third they add a few more, but they build on each other as they go. Do you see that? And and you can see in 6, 7, and 8, some topics start dropping off. So they stay with this kind of small set of topics that build on themselves. Contrast that with how we do it in the United States. So you can see pretty clearly what we try to do in the United States is we try to cover a whole lot of things all the time. And I love this slide because, again, it really showed to me visually, this is what we're doing to kids. This is that, this is that, this is what forces teachers to get into that, okay, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't slow down. I can't, I know you didn't kind of get it, but we gotta move on to the next thing and we're just racing, racing, racing all year long, and you get to the end of the school year, and we've kind of gotten something kind of sort of, rather than in these other countries where they really know, and I should have said this earlier, in these other countries, what they've done is they've identified the two or three or four critical things you have to know when you leave this grade level. The critical concepts you have to understand in mathematics to be successful at the next grade level. Where in the United States, we're like, let's just try to give you coverage on everything, and, and we'll keep repeating it, and hope that you, you get it. Does that make some sense? The other thing that they did by interviewing and assessing teachers in the different countries is they noticed that our teachers have far more mathematics education, but we all understand it less. Understand the math that we're teaching less. And so part of what we're doing here in the district is we are taking what we've already done with mathematics as teachers and we're going more deeply into it and revisiting what is the deep math underpinning and each concept that we need to understand and relearning I mean that's part of teaching we learn a lot every day we have moments where we go oh my gosh I never thought of it that way before that's completely new to me and it could come from a kid so um, our teachers have high levels of education but our system 
hasn't allowed our depth of knowledge to be as great as it is in a lot of other countries. So when the Common Core Standards were designed, this was one of the ideas that they borrowed from Japanese philosophy. I'll let you read it to yourself. So you get the idea, right? We're going to give kids time to learn. It doesn't mean that we're watering things down. It means that they're going to learn things in a much more complex way so that their thinking is stronger and more solid than ours is. And some of us, you know, have gone to levels where we do under, uh, understand things better, but uh, this is what we want for our kids. Deep, deep understanding. And we can do less topics and give them more time in the year to focus on those. So we have some slides here of kids this year in, this, in Lakeside doing mathematics. And these are some of the ways that they are engaging in math to try to exemplify for you what it's looking like um, as we transition to the Common Core. So this is a student who is modeling with mathematics. That's one of the mathematical practices. Modeling can be equations. It can be creating a, a physical model. It can be all sorts of different things, but they're doing more than just writing numbers. They look for patterns, and they persevere and pursue ideas about patterns. They build models and look for structure, a foundational skill as they go into algebra. Do you expect things to make sense? Can you predict? Can you find patterns? Can you generalize? We're doing this even at the kindergarten levels, even TK. Communication is huge. We're working on precision of mathematical thinking. If you need to convince someone in the workforce to buy your idea, you know, how do you need to convince them? How precisely do you need to convince them? And how can you prove things? This is an example of perseverance. These kids here are trying to take all of those geometric solids and put them in order from least to greatest volume without using a formula or anything. They have to choose some tools and try to figure it out. That's really hard. That's what they're working on there. We're working on this idea of collaboration and working as a team. We're asking kids to make sense. And if it's something isn't making sense, to go get a tool so that it does make sense to them. We're also pushing for everyone to participate. Do you remember in school, there were some kids who did and some kids who didn't. And there was that idea that there was this math brain and that some kids had it and some kids didn't. That's not the way it is. Every brain has the potential and the ability to grow. We know this. And we want to make sure that no kid goes through our school system developing an identity that I can't do mathematics. So one of the starting places is everyone participates, and we make sure of that. And this picture is quite cute, isn't it? <laughs> We're asking the kids to solve problems in different ways. So the sheep solved 5 plus 5 equals 10 with her fingers, and she's proving it right there. There's the beginning of mathematical communication, right? This is how I did it. So one of the things I want you to think about is you saw some of the things our students are doing. You heard a little bit about the Common Core Standards. I want you to talk with a partner right now about what do you think are the top five skills our big companies in the United States are looking, with, I'm go are looking for. I'm going to show you those top five skills in a minute and 260 large companies in the United States were surveyed to get to those top five. But right now, talk with a partner. What do you think they are? What do you think one of the top skills is that people are, our companies are looking for? Go ahead. Okay, comprehension of what? There's my second question. I'll push you. Of everything, but there's well, the mathematics Okay. Understanding your mathematics. Okay. What else? Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Could you guys hear that? No. Do you want to say it louder or do you want me to say it for you? Innovation, free new ideas. Okay, excellent. Another thing that we try to do is to leave the words in the mouths of the people who are talking. So I'm only offering because it's a big room, but we try to get the kids to talk loud enough to be heard. Uh, what else? Yes? Uh, good communication and written skills. It's almost impossible to find. Okay, so that's an important skill. Okay, what else? Anything else you think companies are looking for? Our kids said reliability mm. and problem solving. And what do you mean by reliability? I, I call it follow through. That's big, right? Follow through. You say you're going to do something, do it, right? Okay. Anything else? Okay. Here we go. So you can't really
probably see the words very well, but this is the ability to work in a team structure. Right? People are not really working in isolation very much anymore. Really weren't before either, right? Unless you were working, you know, maybe in a factory and you need to talk to someone or something. Okay? You said it back there, the ability to solve problems. And not just the problem that is presented to you and then you practice it, right? But something that's messy and complex and you have an idea of even how you would begin it. You have strategies, you can persevere, you can develop a plan. Okay? Communication, we heard that one. The ability to communicate. Really, really important. And not just communicate with the person next to you, but actually to be able to present so that someone who's not in your immediate context can understand what you're talking about. That's a little trickier. Wouldn't it be nice if all of our students were making plans and being organized and all those sorts of things, right? That's something that we work on in the classrooms, too. And this is a big one. This is a, there's a lot of information out there, right? We want our kids to know how to ask a question and go out and get the information that they need and do something with it to help them solve a problem. That's far more complex than anything we were asked to do. We have to figure out how to help them wrangle all that information into a usable piece of knowledge. So we're trying in the schools right now to bridge this gap between what school math used to be and what the real world is demanding of our children. And I'd like to show you, or talk with you, and our teachers are going to talk with you, about some of the things that we're doing in Lakeside to begin to make this shift. And it will take time. Right? We're at the beginning stages of it, so we're hoping everyone's patient with us. But here's our starting place. We adopted new materials this year, and our teachers are going to talk to you about that. So in K through five, we have the everyday math, and one of the huge components of everyday math is that there are games. And when I say games, they're mathematical games where students often have to critically think about what they're doing, how to play the game, how to use the mathematical skills that they're learning, and then how to play it again, teach someone else, go home and teach their family. So through games, they're reinforcing their learning. We also have manipulatives in K through five, where when I taught fifth grade in the past, you rarely would have manipulatives. And if you did, it would be like a ruler. So when those things are mathematical tools. And as we're teaching fractions, we pull out those manipulatives and we look at those things. In addition, through my knowledge so far um, of the program, we're really teaching how do you conceptualize the numbers? How do you decompose numbers? How do you reorganize them? When we do number talks, which I explain to my parents, a number talk is when we try to solve a problem in your head. So when you're solving a problem in your head, you really have to understand how can you move numbers to keep them organized in your head. And that skill is something that's huge. In addition, through many of the things we do, we're really teaching the mathematical practices and we're really learning them this year as well. Last year, mathematical practices were on our report card. And as teachers, we were like, uh, how do you grade this? So this year, we've, we've gotten a lot of um, professional development, and the practices are embedded. And all those things are the things that Andrea was talking about are those top five things. Understanding, reasoning, critical thinking, problem solving, communicating is all embedded within the curriculum that we have, and then also we're pulling from other places as well. So I'll let you learn about middle school math. All right, so the uh, curriculum that we are using right now is called Springboard. Uh, it's made by College Board. And um, I think the big thing in my classroom that we have been focusing on is the collaboration. Uh, most of the students have a hard time talking to another student about these mathematical ideas because they've never really had a chance to or never been expected to. Um, so at the start of the year with the curriculum, a lot of students were very hesitant about discussing with the person next to them what they thought. Um, but as time has gone on, the, the students have become more comfortable in discussing uh, what they're thinking with their peers and sharing those ideas with the class and allowing the class itself to develop their understanding at a deeper level. Um, I think that's the thing that I've been focusing on most this year, and I'm seeing that with the textbook, um, the textbook is offering or setting up as a guide for us, 
but it's really focusing on those mathematical practices that I've seen a lot of the results come from it. Uh, the students who are engaged and who are participating in these discussions are getting a lot out of it. More than if I was just standing up in the front of the class when I first started teaching and saying, okay, here's the procedure, you do some problems, you go home and you practice those problems and we come back and check to see if you got the right answer. So, and a lot of the problems that we do in class are not your basic two plus two. And I know uh, in sixth grade, um, this past week, we were talking about how to find the area of composite figures. So I drew a shape that was very complex. Um, it had parts that were rectangles, squares, it had a uh, trapezoid in it as well. And so the students came up with multiple approaches on how to break this shape up in order to figure out the area. Um, and then also having a class discussion uh, to support that. So uh, the textbook is great, and I think the shifts that we're, we're going with with the mathematical practices are getting the students not only more engaged with it, but they're understanding it a lot more. We have a video to show you, and John's going to walk up and, and get that operating. No rush, John, we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's, this is a video of a fourth grade class at Lindo Park, and it's a teacher doing something we call a number talk. You've heard Mickey talk about that. This is a practice that we're trying to get in place on a daily basis throughout the district. I know middle school has some challenges with 44 minute periods and things like that, so, but elementary is starting to get to the place where they're able to do this regularly. And a number talk is simply putting a problem up, having everyone think about it for a while, having them talk with a partner. Now you'll notice in the video they talk with a partner at the end, which is a, kind of interesting. Uh, you'll see how, how that goes and what, what it is that the kids have to say. And getting their thinking up on the board so everyone else can see it. We call it a cognitive apprenticeship. So taking what's in someone's brain and making it someone, a mentor for someone else. So how do we take what's in someone's brain and make it visible so others can see it? And so that others could actually those kids that always seem to be the ones that have their hands up and know the answers, how do we get everybody to have access to those strategies? And how do we empower kids who may not think that they have <coughs> strategies, how do we empower them to take a risk and go ahead and share their strategies? So we're going to show you this video, and what we'd like for you to do is just to think about how is this, what you're seeing in here, similar and or different from how you learned math? And what do you notice? Take a minute and talk with a partner. What did you notice? How was that similar or different from how you learned? Could you follow their thinking? Did they accept incorrect answers? Or what do you do with an incorrect answer, right? So chat with a partner. So first of all, could you have recorded what they were saying? That's the type of thing, you know, the media gets a hold of something like that and says, look, this is what they're teaching in the Common Core. No, we're letting kids grapple, and then we're helping bring clarity, right? So what did you notice? So they, they felt pretty good about themselves, okay? What else? What else did you notice? Now what you didn't see in this number talk is that they ended up coming to an agreement in the end on what the answer was and then they all turned to each other and shared their strategies. So they you know, got to an agreement and they found all the errors. But um, what else did you notice? Oh, go ahead. Okay, could you guys hear that? They talked about process. Anything else that you noticed? Go ahead, yes. I think it's interesting to see when you give students an opportunity to grapple with something and then to wrestle with it, how they can often come to the right answer with their peers. And how much learning takes place when you are allowed to make mistakes and then work through it, right? Rather than the teacher being the corrector at all times. So on that note, oh. I have to say that I will be very brief. Um, one of the interesting things that I, that I hope that you see, this may look very different. Was this very different than the way you experienced math? Me too. I mean, this was very, very different. And one of the hard, one of the things that's sometimes hard for us as adults to say, to, see, to grasp, I guess, is we look at that and we say, yeah, but it would be so easy for the teacher just to get up to the board and show, here's how you do it. Put the one on the top, put the other one on the bottom, did, 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 and explain it to them. But here's, here's the key understanding I want you to think about. What we talk a lot of, we talk about a lot with our teachers is, who do we want doing the work, the mental work? Whose brain is working? Who, what we say is, who's carrying the cognitive load? In many, in many of our, our experience, our teachers were the hardest working people in that class. And I was expected to sit and get it or not get it or whatever. But we're trying to flip that around. It would be like going to the gym. I'm gonna get a gym membership, 
I'm gonna go to the gym, I'm gonna watch the trainer do the things, and then I'm gonna go home. Right? If you go to the gym, you go to work out. Now the trainer's there to help you, he's there to show you the thing, maybe he'll model a little bit for you, but ultimately, I gotta do the work if I wanna work it out. That's really kind of what we're trying to get at here. I want their brains going, I want their brains working. Okay, so John, can we turn the lights on for the number talk? So we're going to give you the opportunity right now to participate in a number talk. And Stephanie here is going to be our recorder, which is a challenge to record someone else's thinking. So, And John, who is coming down, is going to ask the question. So you can go ahead and... Oh, different order. So before John comes, just to give you guys a few hand signals that we try to teach our students. Um, so what you kind of saw in the video is I will ask you guys the problem, and then you will come up with as many ideas as you can to how to solve the problem. So when you have one idea, just right in front of you, this is one idea. If you can come up with another one, put a second finger up. A third one, a fourth one. And then this is also to give our students a safety net. We're not, you know, we're not flashing our hands around and embarrassing anybody else. It's just right here. The teacher can see it, and the other students aren't necessarily looking at each other either. They're coming up with the, the, with the process. So once again, and I expect all participation. So when you get one idea right here, two ideas, three ideas, so on. So our problem for the night, we'll keep it easy for you guys, is five times 19. Do not write this down. Do not write this down. You're only using your brains. Now, before we discuss how you got to the answer, and in just a soft voice, let me hear what answers you guys got. 95. So I hear 95, and John will scribe for me. So for five times 19, we got 95. Did I miss anybody? Did anybody else get a different answer? It's okay if you did. Okay. Now, with, without any other answers, I want you to turn to a partner. Someone who you're sitting next to, how did you get five times 19? How did you get five times 19? I explain it to your partner, and make sure your partner gets a chance to discuss it as well. So, um, before we continue on with this, I do want to point out how John had written five times 19. I think we can all agree that when we learn multiplication, and I saw some of you guys trying to write things down, I saw that, but you guys know how we learned it, right? We wrote one on top of another, uh, but just notice how he describes this. It's something to kind of keep in mind that this is what the teachers are doing in the classrooms. Now, do we have a brave volunteer to tell us how they solved five times 19? All right, in the back, if, and keep in mind that he will be scribing exactly what you'll be saying, so we want to make it clear. And this is what we expect of our students as well, that they need to articulate so that we can scribe it. Five times 20, Mommy, um, one, two, three, four, five, How many of you did it this way? Okay. Now, does this, is what you wrote exactly how you thought the process went? Okay, now I'm curious why he did this. I'm curious why he did this. Think for a second, and let me direct you to the five in particular. Why did he subtract that five? Think about it for a second. Now discuss this with your partner. Why did he multiply five times 20 and then subtract five? Discuss that real quick. Okay, I do apologize. What was your name? Okay, Tom, to continue with this process, so we wrote down five times 20 minus five. What did you get as your final answer? Just check it, just making sure. This, this is how the kids react to us too, but they practice. Now, Tom told us five times 20 minus five. Can someone else reword what he said in your own words and then explain to us 
how you got those numbers. Okay, do we have any brave volunteers? Was everybody able to hear her? Can I get one more person to verbalize what she just said? In your own words. Nobody else? Uh, I, I was kind of thinking money, so 20s, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. So it would be five groups of 20, but I had to take one away from each of them because the number was 19, so it gave me 19 groups. Okay, very good. So he's talking about grouping money, rounding, 5 times 20 minus 5. So all similar methods, but different ways of discussing it. And that's what we're looking for in our students as well. Now, did somebody else get a different method than Tom? Yep. Go ahead. And your name, please? Yvonne. Yvonne. I have two different ways, actually. Can you just give us one for now, please? Um, uh, the, I did 5 times. Now, can you take a look at what he wrote? Is that does that communicate how? Oh, okay. there. That's what you're doing. No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so why didn't he attend? The why V of M. And this is important to us as teachers. We want to give the students accountability. So we write their names down um, when they're discussing it, and then also we can refer to Yvonne's idea, Tom's idea. Um, and acknowledge them. So is that how you articulated it? Okay. How many of you did it Yvonne's way? All right. Very good. Is there a third way that we can come up with? And your name? Uh, Michelle. Michelle. Okay. And that's definitely not incorrect. That's just one other way of us learning. And that's, I think, for the majority, that's how we learned it. So don't feel that it's, it is a little more difficult to explain. And again, our students have trouble explaining it, but it's another way. How many of us did it this way? Very good. Um, just because of time, I'm sure there's a few other ways. We, we actually did this as a middle school group today, and we actually went into a sixth grade class, a seventh grade class, an eighth grade class, and did this exact same activity. We got all of these similar answers, and a few more as well. So I think it just goes to show that our students, um, w when we let them, they have a bunch of different ways to go through it. And um, you know, I know, I know there's a lot of talk about Common Core, and oh, why would we do it in such a long method? But think of the number sense that our students have in order to do it like this, instead of, oh, well, we carry the five and we round the four, and, or however they say it, right? They, they truly understand the meaning of numbers and the meaning of what we're doing when we multiply. And I think that's a very important thing for us to kind of spend on something basic that we learn on a standard algorithm. Now our students can actually articulate it. So I hope you guys were able to at least see how cool it is to experience our students being able to think this way. Thanks. Thank you, Stephanie and Tom. Go ahead, Stephanie. that is.
is clearly defined in the Common Core Standards. Not all the different ways necessarily in the the way the standards progress. It'll say, you know, in the first couple of years when they're being introduced to a concept, that they need to solve it using strategies based on place value, that they need to be able to use models, that they need to be able to explain their thinking. And in everyday math, it does have some specific strategies that they're asking them to try. Uh, but there is, in the third year of any sequence, you introduce multiplication in year one, year two, your modeling, your building, and in year three, they say that the kids do need to be introduced to the traditional algorithm. And that happens, you know, whether it's a four, five, six span, or a two, three, four, depending on what's being introduced. Now, each teacher works with this in different ways. So sometimes if they're introducing a new strategy, they might be asking everyone to try it on for size. Let's see if everyone can do this. What do you think of it? Is it efficient for you? Does it make sense? Let's try another one. Which way works best for you? Yes. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really good feedback. I think that's a conversation we want to have with our teaching staff. Here's the, here's what we want. There's two main things. I'm listening and I'm watching. There's two real big things that I think we want. And I I'm projecting my own math experience here because um, I was not the strongest math student when I was a kid. The first thing we want is we want we really want kids to understand how numbers work. Here's the thing. We could teach them how to do the 19 over the five like we like we showed here, right? We could teach them. We all learned how to do this. The thing is, um, there comes a point, if the kids really don't understand, like when someone said, um, when Yvonne said five times 10, five times nine, a good question might be, where'd that 10 come from? Well, it came out of the 19. Where'd that nine come from? You wanna, I'm gonna tell you this, this is almost embarrassing to say, but hey, let's be vulnerable, right? I figured out that that works at the age of 34 as an elementary school principal. I did not know that that worked. I'm just gonna tell you right now. And here's what happens. When kids don't understand how those numbers work, all they can do is learn how to follow the rules, which is what I did. And that worked fine all the way through elementary school, the middle school is getting a little tough, but I could still do it. When I hit algebra, I hit a wall. I did not understand why these things work the way they work, and all I could do was hold on like with a death grip to the thing. He told me to do the thing and flip the thing over there and put it over there, and hopefully I'll get the right answer. Right? How many of us have that experience? So that's that's what we don't want. We want kids, even at the earliest age, to understand this is what place value is. This is how you can take a 19 apart, and a 10 and a 9 is the same thing as a 19. We want them to understand that so they don't hit that wall. The second thing is we don't want kids turning off. I'll tell you, I turned off. I, I hit high school, and I hit that first hard math class, and I said, get me out of here as fast as I can get. I went straight to the languages, because that's what that was better for me. I could do that. And we don't want kids doing that, because the other thing that you'll notice in this class how many of the kids were talking and engaging and trying to figure that problem out in that video? How many of them? All of them. Now how many of us, and I won't ask for a raise of hands, I'll, I'll raise my hand. How many of us in our classes, whether you in early you know, elementary school, we knew who the, who the bright kids were, and we knew when the teacher called them, oh yeah, I know he's gonna answer. All I gotta do is sit here. If I can sit here, and even if I can slink down just a little bit, I can be nice and quiet, I can get through this, right? And nobody will call on me. See, you're laughing because you did it too, right? And that's what we don't want, right? We don't want our kids, we have, I'll to be honest, we got kids in our seats right now who are like that. Kids in our seats in Lakeside right now who are hoping I don't get called on and hoping that the, that the bright kid, the math kid, whoever the kid is, is gonna carry this lesson for the rest of us. And that's what we're trying to shift, okay? I don't know if that helps, but I wanna share that, yeah. That's a good question. Teachers are saying yes. So, and this is part of the what we're working on with teachers to kind of think through, you know, what makes sense here. You know, grades in and of themselves become this driver, right? And it can turn a kid off. When they're using the program that they currently have, there are specific strategies that they want them to try. And a way around devaluing a strategy that a student has is say, can you show me this way? And then choose another strategy that you also want to show it with. That way a strategy that's really comfortable for you still gets value 
and you're still being accountable for trying something else. This strategy here that Yvonne offered, this is um, the application of the distributive property. It's foundational for work with algebra. You can't go on without knowing that. I don't know how Dr. Johnson survived. But, <laughs> but, so there are reasons that they're pushing on it, but we, we may need to have conversations about the feedback that we're giving students and how that's affecting their perception of math. You know, to get something wrong versus trying something new, you know, what are we doing with that? And that's, that, that's a place where everybody's trying to figure out what to do. It's, everybody's learning and growing. Okay, one of the things that, we, does that answer your question? We wanted to just show you a little bit about our teachers here in Lakeside are participating in math professional development. That means they are doing math together. They are being the students. They are being taught and they are engaging as though they are in a classroom and they're seeing how it feels. They're seeing how it feels to have someone say one strategy is better than another or something like that. And they're beginning to reflect and make choices about that. Okay, and they were doing this across all of the schools. I know that we're running a little bit over right now, and I know this was the most important part to many of you, so we're going to go through this and take questions as we go. We have five pieces of advice for you for how to support your child. One is, in the car, anywhere else that you are, play math games, number games, anything that you can do, do puzzles, develop logical thinking, get kids to talk about math. Some of the most accomplished mathematicians say it was the conversations in the car that they had with their parents, the games they played at the table that actually gave them their foundation. So you play a huge role. And I wanted to say something too, um, at least in elementary and I'm pretty sure in middle school, we've been teaching kids to play games in class. We do a lot of game playing in class. So having your kids teach you the game they learned in class is really valuable as well because they become the teacher, they show you what they're learning and the strategies that they're using, then it's just a fun thing that they can play with you at home or on the dinner table or something like that. Another tip that we have is when your child comes home and does math in a strange way that you think makes no sense and you want to take the pencil and show them a better way to do it, instead ask the question, can you tell me about your thinking? How did you do that? And you might be surprised that there's some logic to their reasoning. It might be something they saw someone else do in a number talk, and they decided to try it at home that night. And if you say, no, 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 you know what, this is nonsense, this is common core math, give me your pencil, let me show you the algorithm, you know, they're, they could get a mixed message. Now they might have misunderstanding in what they're doing, but if you ask a lot of questions, explain to me, where did this number come from, why are you doing this, they might really be able to work through some of that confusion. Another tip is the idea of being open to different ways of thinking about math. It's really hard for us, right? We know fast, efficient ways we've done it. The problem is that students from the United States haven't done very well with these procedures. It's showing up all over the place. We say it was fine for us. In the good old days, we knew this. We knew how to do it. Well, the good old days weren't so good because we have not been performing well for a long time. And so this is a shift to try to change and catch our students up with the A-plus countries so they can be competitive and be thinkers and reasoners about math. Okay, another one is when you come to a word problem or something that your kids are working on and they're puzzled by it, ask them to draw a picture. What's going on in this situation? Can you make sense of it with a picture? The minute we go to write an equation or something like that for them, we went from confusing to completely abstract and they miss that step in between, that sometimes just making sense and drawing a picture, now they can do the math. Okay. And this is a really important one. Believe that your child can be good at math and make sure that they hear it, that they hear your belief. There's one big mistake that we see over and over and over again, and there have been studies on this. So you'll, you'll know if you've done it the minute I say it. Saying to a child, oh, I wasn't good at math. Don't worry about it, I wasn't good either, just get through it, right? Some people are smiling. Parent conferences, we hear this in about half of the parent conferences. I wasn't good at math either, it's my fault. The minute they hear that, it's okay now. It's hard, I don't have to try. I don't have to persevere. My role model says that it's okay not to be good. Would we say that about reading? It's okay, I'm not good at reading, but you don't have to read. Just get through this. Right? We wouldn't say that. For some reason in math, it's this one thing in America that seems to come up again and again, and probably other countries too. Don't worry about it, we try to protect them, but instead they get the message, you don't have to be good at math. I wasn't, you're not, don't worry about it. 
So if that's something that you say to the kids, try not to. Try to be that, I know you can do this. I can figure it out too. I'm learning with you. So those are our tips. And I know we're a little bit over. We will stay here and answer questions as long as you guys have them. But if, we, if you have child care issues or anything else that you need to deal with or dinner to put on the table, we also will not fault you if you need to leave. So I just want to thank you all again for coming out. I know we were kind of racing through, but we, will, we do have time for questions if you want. I hope this has been helpful. Um, I appreciate you guys coming out. I know many of you are coming straight from work. It's a long day. You're tired. But this is an important conversation for us. And, and again, I hope you were... Uh, Hope you benefited from it. And thank you to our teachers who came out as well. They've had a long, long, long day with kids, and we're about to do it in the morning right, right over again. So thank you very much for coming out, and we appreciate it.